Hey everyone, my name is Perry, I'm an electrical engineer, and today we're going to watch Dr. Stone episode 21 to see how accurate all the science and technology in this TV show really are. <laughs> Relative to other things in electrical engineering, batteries are really they're pretty simple. There's there's three main parts to a battery: the anode, the cathode, and the electrolyte. The anode is the negative terminal, which is one of the two metal plates inside the battery, and that will discharge electrons to the cathode, or the positive end, through the electrolyte. The cathode is the positive terminal, which is the other metal plate, and that will be pulling electrons from the anode in what's called a redox reaction, which is reduction oxidation. The electrolyte is a liquid solution that will keep the two um, ends of the battery, the anode and the cathode, from making contact with each other. And it's also the medium which the electrons will use to transfer from one end to the other. The flow of electrons through the electrolyte is what produces the electrical energy. When the battery is being used to power a circuit, the electron flow is from negative to positive or from anode to cathode. But in this case, the battery is being charged, so the electron transfer is flipped it goes from positive to negative, or cathode to anode. In a 2 volt battery, the overall potential is 2 volts, which means the anode has a 2 volt potential, and the cathode has a 0 volt potential. The longer you use the battery, the more electrons are flowing from the anode to the cathode, until eventually an equilibrium is reached, where each of the ends has a 1 volt potential, and when that happens, your difference is 0 volts, and that's when your battery dies. And because the anode and cathode are both equal at 1 volt, there's no longer a flow of electrons. And if there's no flow of electrons, that means there's no more production of electrical energy. Nowadays, pretty much all batteries are rechargeable, so when you do reach that equilibrium, you have to charge the battery, which means you're moving all the electrons from the positive cathode to the negative anode, so that your potential, instead of being at 0 volts, will be 2 volts on the anode, 0 volts on the cathode, which is a total of 2 volt potential. As I was explaining that, I could see how that would be confusing, and I completely get it. So if I didn't explain that properly, or if I like might have missed something that like I sped over it, just go ahead and let me know in the comments, and I'll make another video explaining it if people didn't like fully understand from this explanation. <laughs> I don't think that young dude will get shocked like that, but there's there's enough like batteries going on that it'll have some serious juice that could really hurt somebody. There are two fundamental ways to organize an analog circuit, which is one series and another parallel. In a series circuit, the voltage from the battery is evenly distributed amongst all the components, but the downside is if you remove one of these components, then the entire circuit fails. When I say the voltage is evenly distributed amongst all the components in the series circuit, like I don't mean to say that each of them will have like, if it's a 5 volt battery attached in the series circuit, they're not each going to have 5 volts. I mean, amongst all the components, if you add up all the volt voltages across all of them, that will equal the voltage from your battery, which is 5. In a parallel circuit, you can remove multiple components and the circuit will still continue to function. The downside to this is that if you have a 5 volt battery connected to a parallel circuit, each of the components will never have 5 volts. It will be evenly distributed, so the, it's an equivalent resistance amongst all of them. You can get some really high voltage levels if you wire your circuit in a series form, whereas if you um, do everything in parallel, then you're not going to get as high a voltage, but you'll get some really high current levels. Right here, Senku has all of his batteries laid out in series, which means he's building a very high level of voltage. <laughs> Uh, that is absolutely what it does. Senku has essentially built a running furnace that will operate 24-7. This adaptation comes from a specific type of gear called a half gear, and it's named as such because on the circular object, the grooves are only on one side or half of the circle. So as it's moving back and forth, like you, you can actually see right here that the grooves are not on the entire object, it's only on one part of it. And this will do the work of more than the entire village combined, and it's going to be consistent, so you can really get like very level heat. So you, you can create a lot of really, really cool stuff with this. 
I mean, really, as long as that river is flowing, he has a steady supply of heat, which he can use for, um, like, cooking or creating, like, more swords or just, like, heating the entire village so no one's cold during the winter. I wish they showed the entire um, like Mercury pump in some sort of diagram because then I can explain to you guys exactly what each part is responsible for. What Senku is using is called a Sprengel pump and it utilizes liquid mercury exactly as he's doing to vacuum out all the air that would be inside of a light bulb. How it works is that on one end of the pump you have an opening where you drip down all the liquid mercury and then in the middle of the pump you have the actual light bulb that's attached which is exactly how they set it up here it was done perfectly. And at the bottom of the pump, there's a little beaker that collects all the liquid mercury that you were dripping in from the top. And because the mercury is so heavy, every time you drip like uh, one drop of mercury, it'll flow down the tube and then through the uh, light bulb where it'll catch some of the air. And then that air will be transported down out of the whole thing. So the more you drop liquid mercury down the top of it, the more air will be trapped in between each of the uh, like liquid mercury drops until there's no air left inside the light bulb. You do need to vacuum out all the air inside of a light bulb, otherwise when you turn it on, the filament will heat up so much that it will um, heat all the air around it and it will cause the light bulb to combust and that's why they explode. Having no air in the light bulb also produces a problem because um, right now most of the light bulbs we use have a tungsten filament and if you have no air inside the light bulb, the tungsten filament, it gets really, really hot and what starts to happen is it will begin to evaporate while it's actually inside. To solve this problem, now the light bulbs that we have in our house and all the ones that they sell have argon inside of the light bulb. And the reason they have argon is because it really, really slows down the evaporation process of tungsten, which is why the light bulbs we use have such a long life. The only real addition I have to this explanation is a question. Where did Senku get all that liquid mercury? Like, did it... I mean, I'm asking this question because if they had it somewhere earlier on in the show, I don't remember, but he has a very large amount, which I think he just like pulled out of his ass or something. I don't know where he got that from. That, um, oh yeah, that certainly is an issue, but... For, for us in the modern day, we don't have that problem because what we do is th there's in between the wire and the glass itself, there's like a very small gel like substance and it, it feels like Play-Doh actually. And the reason we use the gel and then we use a smaller wire is just for this reason in case the wire slightly contracts or expands then that gel will actually fill in the gap so that there's no air holes inside. The reason that we use a gel is because in warmer climates or just like wherever you are in like much higher temperature areas, it will cause the wire to slightly expand. And if you're in a much colder area, it'll cause the wire to contract. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, bamboo is certainly a filament that I would not recommend that anyone uses because it does burn out very very quickly like it's it doesn't do that well, well under extremely high temperatures. Modern filaments are made out of tungsten and when I tell you tungsten is a metal that will resist the highest levels of heat that you can imagine because for, for a light bulb for example they're on like for a very long time at once. It, it's not like a camera for example that you would only turn on if you had to take a picture a light bulb inside of your kitchen that's on all the time what i mean by that is like when you wake up in the morning and you flick on the light switch that light is pretty much on the whole day until you have to go to bed then you turn it off and that's every day for like what 10 hours a day or probably more than that if you're at home and that has to last for a couple of years yeah, tungsten is an extremely heat-resistant metal, and that's why it's used in pretty much all filaments of all light bulbs today. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to see more Dr. Stone, go ahead and put it in the comments down below. Or if you want me to watch any other movie or TV show and commentate over that, I'll be happy to do so. Thanks again for watching. Stay fresh and stay golden.